born. I was born in Bilbao's Karma, a small Miskito village on the Wanki River between Honduras and Nicaragua. My grandmother lived in that village. When each one of her grandchild was born, she planted a tree. I was, and I, I guess I'm still that coconut tree, a beautiful coconut tree in, the, in her yard that was a farm. I remember the coffee trees, the star apple trees, the pineapple, the mango, the chickens. I remember working with my cousins and my sisters. We would compete to see who would get the milk from the cow for breakfast. She would sing at night, and in her songs, she would remind us of our ancestors that were so brave. She would tell us stories about the moon, and she would tell us to respect the movement of the moon when we're going to plant. She would tell us stories about the spirits of the water, the spirits of the wood. She would tell us stories, and she would remind us that we should protect our land, our territory, and we should remember that land is life, and we should respect the customary law that reminds us of harmony between nature and humanity. My father and my mother kept the tradition. And although my father wasn't so happy because he only had daughters, and he would have loved to have a son to work on the farm, he accepted us. And he taught us to make cheese, to take care of the cattle, one of the things that we love most as sisters was to plant during the dry season. We plant on the other side of the river, and we would go and spend two hours swimming, and then we would go and plant. And they taught us that during the dry season, we should prepare for the rainy season, because if not, we would suffer hunger. It was called Sang Lang, if we were not prepared. A lot of things have changed since those days. But I still remember that during those days, there were some things I did not understand very well. I did not understand why some of my girlfriends were forced to marry early, they were sold, they were exchanged. I did not understand why the first day we went to school we were not accepted because we did not speak Spanish. That was the national language. I did not understand why my father, that worked as a mechanic with a banana company, did not get any salary. At the end of the month, he would get a voucher, and with that, we would go to the, to the company store and get products. But things have changed a lot in the last years. More and more rural women have been recognized because of the role they play in food production. We have gained autonomy. Our language is recognized and is taught in school. But rural women are still facing a lot of problems. Rural women are the ones that produce between 60 and 80% of the food. But if we look at the loans, maybe 10%. If you look at technical assistance, 5%. So we still have to struggle a lot as rural women. But my main concern is that usually when there's support for rural women, they treat all rural women the same. They don't respect diversity of rural women. 
Some rural women are landowners, some are workers, some are indigenous, some are non-indigenous. We live in different ecosystems. We have different type of history of oppression. We have different system of knowledge, but we are treated the same. As indigenous women, we are more than 100 million of rural indigenous women in the world. We share common history, and I would like to share some of the history of indigenous rural women. Bibidilia, she's an old lady in my community. Bibidilia was sold when she was 14 years old, and she was sent far away from her community and her family. And she had a very difficult life. During the 80s, she was displaced because of the war with her daughters. And although she suffered a lot, she saw that as an opportunity to send her children to school. Today, her two daughters are nurses, and her grandchild is a doctor, a medical doctor. In those days, Bibidilia saw that it was important to struggle for peace. So she became part of the movement of women for peace and autonomy. And she crossed the border to Honduras. She went to the different camps where the men were fighting. And she convinced them with other women that they should sign the peace and autonomy agreements. Once the, art, the war ended and we gained autonomy, Bibidilia saw that it was very important to gain land rights recognition. So she became part of the movement of women that went and consulted all of the village to get the approval of the bill to recognize collective land rights. Now, Bibidilia is one of the leaders of her community, and she's part of the authority of land of her territory. She has a beautiful farm in her home. She has received chicken, pigs, even a cow as part of the program that the government has to support rural women. But she's not happy. We are still facing autonomy. We are still facing violence. So Bibidilia now, she's part of the movement of women that is ch challenging the customary administration of justice system so they can begin to respect women. And when women face violence, they can begin to respect human rights. So Bibi Dilia no, is part of that movement and she's trying to make one, the 115 communities of our river to be open shelters to protect women. Tarsila my Quechua sister from Ayacucho. She also had a very difficult life. Tarsila, after the conflict in Peru, she got together with the women from her communities and they decided to see what they can do as women. And they identified that the main problem was undernourished children. So they decided to organize as women and use traditional knowledge to regain our, their system of uh, traditional production and also the traditional food system. Three generations have passed. The new group, the Nyohanshi group, is very active in the communities. I spent some days with them, and it is so empowering to be with them singing, dancing, farming, exchanging knowledge, practicing reciprocity and complementarity. My friend Agnes is part of the Maasai family that live outside of Nairobi. She has joined her husband and they are working very hard to change the life of girls and women in her community. They support the girls that goes to school. 
and they're protecting them from early ma marriage, and they're protecting them from genital mutilation. Although it is forbidden by the Constitution, it is still practiced in the communities. The girls are learning to be proud of their culture in school, but they're also learning that there are some aspects of culture that can and should change. As how Agnes tells me, I have invited the chiefs and traditional leaders of the community to be part of this initiative. If we do not convince men to become allied, we are not going to change the life of those girls and those women. And we have the opportunity because we have a new constitution, a devolution process that gives more strength to the local authorities. As I said, a lot of things have changed since I was that little girl in Bilwas Karma. But the most important thing is that we, indigenous rural women, have learned that we have equal rights like the rest of men and women. And we are struggling together to change, to make those rights be respected and implemented. But the most important thing is that at the same time, we are very proud of who we are. We are proud of our history, of our culture, and of our livelihood.